Okay, welcome back. Um, so this is the beginning. So let me uh, share with you the definition of the visibility that we use, and we have adapted from a condition that appeared already almost 10 years later um, uh, by the group of Clearbus. And uh, this definition is that authors simply provide all the necessary data and all of the computer codes to run the analysis again, recreating the results. Now, believe it or not, this is still um, somewhat controversial in some fields. Um, this is about the first publication of the, the, the group of Clearbus that's the first to use the research as a phrase, and this is the first uh, publication where they, they uh, share this idea. We have adopted this definition, and we, indeed, in my group, share all the data, all of the computer uh, codes that we use to generate any research results. Uh, a few years later, uh, the, the community has developed this idea of a spectrum of representation. Because one thing is to share the computer codes and all the analysis, but quite another is to get to a point where somebody else can actually do a new study that confirms the uh, findings, the scientific findings of a previous result. And this has been called, I'm sorry, but my noise, this has been called uh, replication. So, using a full replication study means you collect new data again, you may uh, do a uh, use of methods perhaps that you can confirm the findings. So, this is a spectrum from the minimum standard of sharing the data and the code to this uh, uh, final idea of replication, all of which is to develop trust in the scientific process and the findings. And so this idea of application, just to be on the same page, is to arrive at the same findings of another study, collecting new data, possibly with different methods. Of course, this is not always possible to do. For example, if you're doing an opportunistic epidemiological study, you might not be able to, to uh, collect this data again, because it happens at a given point in time. But on the other end of the spectrum, reproducible research is really only limited by the time and effort that we're willing to put in. Now, from the group of Claire, comes this very interesting idea that I've been thinking about and I want to share with you. She writes in different uh, places, um, different forms of this, this idea. That interactive products, she says, very partly are slavery, and they think we'll get ready to arrive at any previous by means of a script. So, this is a big no to do if you want to do a physical research. I gave her one talk uh, uh, where I, uh, uh, to, to a group of computer scientists where I mentioned this, and there was big pushback from the, from, the, from the audience. So, that's an interesting idea. On the other hand, Jupiter uh, is, of course, a set of open source tools for interactive exploratory computing. So, from Fernando Bryan's uh, code, the state of Jupiter, again in the O'Reilly uh, blog, they say that Project Jupiter aims to create a database model for tools for interactive computation and data analysis, where the direct participation of humans in the computational loop, executing code, understanding the problem, iteratively, gives the primary consideration. So this is the idea. So well, uh, the idea of uh, an interactive tool, in addition to uh, uh, a tool that can help create this reputable computational analysis, is what I want to think about today with you. Because Jupiter is promoted as a solution for creating a reputable computational analysis. Some see it as a means of putting into practice the idea uh, of news of literature programming, uh, where code is directly annotated by comprehensible documentation. The thinking process of a human in the loop. But some researchers object to this idea uh, that Jupiter is good for representativity. They know it's so-called problems with the notebook because of the nonlinear nature of the interaction uh, of code cells and order execution and other uh, problems with perhaps version control or not being able to integrate a workflow, workflow analysis. So there's been quite a bit of debate in some, in some areas, in some communities, about whether the notebook is indeed a good uh, tool for representative research. So what is this problem here? There's a, there seems to be a tension, a, a, a contradiction between interactivity and representativity. Indeed, interactive tools were seen by the pioneers of reproducible research as the complete antithesis of reproducibility. So what makes Jupiter different than, say, the dreaded fleshy? <laughs> Why is the cell different than Jupiter? What is it about the interface, the tool? What is it about the design that is different? Here is Professor, you can refer to Professor to start talking about Excel. I'll just read that. 2014, he gives a talk about uh, using Excel for your analysis. So, he wrote a blog post in 2014 titled Science is Show Me, Not Trust Me. And he offered a checklist of points that uh, you should follow for representativity. The first point in his checklist is if you rely on Excel for computation, fail. He explains that spreadsheets make it very hard to do it for the research because it's hard to document every construct, what you click and what you didn't click and what order you did it, how the user interface complex input, output, code, presentation, and it makes testing and discovery plus very difficult. So this is a problem. This is a problem of design. A problem of design standing in the way of representativity. The second point that he makes is that if you did not script your analysis, including all the data and all the cleaning and all the mungering and all of the other uh, steps, uh, intermediate steps, then also that's a fail. Because if you, so it doesn't mean that you cannot use interactive tools or point and click uh, interaction in the intermediate steps, but it does mean that you need to, at one point, figure out what needs to be done, just put it all together in an automated process, script it out in a way that you can confirm that you can regenerate the whole process from scratch. And again, it's a design recommendation. A workflow is a design recommendation. Now, let me just make a uh, turn to make sure that we understand why we care about this problem of reproducibility. It's why I have to hit the New York Times and all of the major uh, publications. Well, we care about computational reproducibility because we're using computing to create new knowledge. We're using it as an avenue of scientific discovery. It is so embedded in every single field of science today. It's really, computing is a form of learning, a form of, form of discovery. We're creating knowledge. And this, this is using computers um, as extensions of our mind. Uh, it's, it's a uh, whole field uh, that analyzes representation modes and how some people call it material intelligence. For example, algebra, mathematics is material intelligence. Something that we use as extensions of our mind to make comprehensible the world. We make science with computers, and science demands reproducibility, so this is why we care about it. And science, uh, there is um, a theory of dynamical connectivism, and uh, one of the leaders of the theory, Stephen Downs, a philosopher in Canada, uh, was uh, George Stevens, they were the first to uh, do an open online course, connectivist, it was called in 2008, way before the moved craze in 2012, and Stephen Downs said that science is a conversation. Um, this, is, this is a several statement that is rather deep. The idea that actually you make you do a science by having a conversation with perhaps your body of knowledge, with other hands, scientists, or a conversation between scientists and instruments and machines. It gives you the connectivist uh, explanation of what really constitutes the process of doing science. What is the conversation? So here, I, I take a few minutes for, to, to go in a bit of a philosophical dive with you. Uh, this is, um, uh, I guess, inspiration from the field, the old field of cybernetics. I'm having an interview probably the room that I'm mentioning cybernetics. And, uh, uh, so I'm going to conversation. Participant A has a goal and contact participant B, choosing a shared language. Now, shared language is a conversation, of course. Um, participant B needs to engage if the conversation needs to continue. 
half of the action. And the goal of that loop is to create a commitment. And that's where actions happen. It's those participants come to a commitment, then actions can continue. The agreement is what we are looking after in a conversation. And when we agree as a community about the scientific discovery, this is a process that also is occurring. We can have conversations about goals, about means, and so on. Uh, in the interface, there could be some tool creating that conversation. <laughs> now, how do we design conversations for the facility? And I only have a few minutes for this presentation, so I cannot really give you any more than the syllabus for this topic. I'm thinking about it. And there is a very classic book by Herbert Simon, who was a Nobel Prize in Economy, a Turing Award, and a multi talented a professor, Simon from Carnegie Mellon. And he said that design is concerned with how things should be, with devising artifacts for that design certain goals. Uh, everyone designs who devises courses of production to change existing situations to make them better. Some situation we can find outside the classic work of user interface design. This book by Schneiderberg has recommended it's a standard for that 1986 for the first edition, and she says that the tools that succeed have to be comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. So an obscure tool does not satisfy this, uh, this trio. This opportunity to design design. Those who have authority and responsibility must have adequate levels of control. Who is the person who has responsibility in the process of science and in ensuring the possibility? The humans. So we have this uh, dollar between the humans that need to be in control and this idea of automation. We must not believe we less responsibility as humans and try to uh, assign that to a tool. The idea of ensuring human control while increasing automation. So here is a quote um, of uh, this pair of seven editions on 21st century design. Design has a status from giving forms to, cre to creating systems that support human interactions. So this is what should be our inspiration when thinking about how we make tools that are going to encourage reproducible research. Uh, the human interactions that we're talking about uh, include thinking, acting together, making commitments, and with a, with, a, with a purpose, feedback, learning, and so on. I encourage you to have a look at this, uh, this idea of design from the cybernetics point of view. And, and, and I invite you to think about Jupiter not as a tool uh, that is just for computing, but a tool that is an interface to have conversations, uh, a shared language, if you will, to increase agreement and to lead to trust. Because responsibility is really about trust. Now, I don't expect that we are going to solve responsibility within your process that takes away the responsibility of the human participants and attempts to work with one click. I've seen several tools that have been proposed that attempt to solve the problem of responsibility with just one click. And that is not a conversation. I have it here, and that's, about, that's not a conversation. We cannot relinquish the responsibility of the human in the loop for reproducible research, which is essentially about trust. So, that's my message today. The facility is not a one-click solution, and we, we can take inspiration in several uh, sources about design to think about how to accomplish the uh, goals of the other group of achieving fully complex computation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, you know, as I said, I'm Edward, one of the CTO of Hydia, and uh, we're really thrilled to be participating in, uh, in hosting SuperCon with the Public Foundation and then uh, Project Jupiter. And I want to show you a presentation here and kind of the history of the company. Uh, so we've had a long, uh, a long track record of spy innovations early. Uh, O'Reilly, uh, the first commercial website on the internet, uh, we created the term Web 2.0, came out of uh, O'Reilly that we launched a major movement with uh, the publication of uh, Make Magazine, and even the term of this work uh, came from an original uh, O'Reilly event. So we really helped identify, popularize, and catalyze a lot of the kinds of technology movements. And I think one of the things that's really on the radar is Jupiter, that's kind of one of the next big things that's coming up. And you know, I think it's probably, as you listen to speakers like uh, Dr. Bobby yesterday, and Rebecca just now, and Jeremy, um, uh, earlier this morning, and uh, everybody in the session, it's really Jupiter is a tool that's fundamental to the mission of our company, which is how to spread the knowledge innovators, getting the information out of people who know things and getting it to a wide audience in the first way. And Jupiter's ability to lead complex computational narratives that include text and code and images and interactive kinds of elements are really allow that making transition, and that's what we're so fascinated by. So we're really looking to use this to help us create kind of the next generation of technical media. And what I want to talk about a little bit at first is just kind of approach how we're thinking about how this process will actually work. And then we're going to talk about the chair. I didn't say, oh, we want to work with you uh, to help create this, both as creators of the, the tools, creators of the media, and also people who are consuming it and using it. So first up, our approach uh, is basically a very simple three-part model. Uh, it starts with your content, to which we add a Docker file, and then we have a web time for your, your container. So how do you actually get this button to the book itself? Uh, for content, uh, everything, I think, um, in our tool chain, typically begins with Git. So again, for the repository that has your notebooks, uh, your data, your assets, basically like, everything you need for whatever kind of media you're creating, uh, needs to get a plug into the repository. Uh, this is a screenshot of our internal uh, GitLab uh, repository. We've got, um, uh, so we've got about 6,000 different Git projects that we use to create all of our, all of our books and materials. Uh, it's not all really super, but you know, it's a deep commitment to Git, so we've been using a long time. It's a very successful tool. Uh, the, the second part of the model is we add a Docker file to one of these repositories. And uh, if you're with Docker, it's very quickly to specify the feeding environment so that you can say, here's all the different keys that uh, the feeding you need for a process to run, and then you can ship packages out of the container and then you ship anywhere. Uh, we use uh, the Docker Stacks project, which is another object project supported by the Jupyter community, which provides a number of Docker files to give you a variety of computing scenarios. So if you're doing scientific computing, you can just say, I want to use Docker files for scientific computing, and it comes with, you know, a different pieces of software. Similarly, there's one for, for data science, for Scala, for R, for uh, TensorFlow, so really a host of different kinds of things, and it really helps you get started quickly. Then um, the last part of the model is the time. Like, how do you actually, once you've got a notebook, you've got to give the presentation of what your uh, the product product is, how do you actually run that notebook? And so looking at this, um, down in the end, so I've got everything that you've got to make we've got about uh, breaking that up into this sort of grid. Like, if you're running it on your own computer, you run time, maybe it's just Conda, and if you're running Conda, how about an important uh, tool that is, so you, you might use Conda. You might use Docker or uh, a virtual box on your own machine, so you're, you're running it inside of what you're on your own computer. Or you might use Jupyter, how about you're pointing it to the cloud somewhere. Or Binder, or Jeremy, how do you think it is that uh, the Jupyter the Jupyter product can be supporting uh, Binder? Or you might just simply run it on the cloud on uh, something like uh, Azure or uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud. So however you do it, you need to be able to give the users a, 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 a running system. And that's a problem we're working on coming to So Joe, that's kind of how we think about it. Let's kind of let's 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 for you if you if you work with us. What are the options that you have as people who are, who are creating this stuff? Um, the first is obviously books. We've been a long time of the design. But long ago, it's a lot of software. A supporter of using the books for creating uh, books and just traditional kinds of media. Probably the most popular has been on the Python Design Handbook in Tina, which is like a data class, so it's a wonderful reference. But what's really cool about it is because we've got the consistency and we use it, we've also been able to keep cross licenses so that you can put it up on GitHub. 
some of them end up. And I think that all, for example, very harmoniously, uh, and be able to continue this contribution work going forward so that we can continue to have really impactful, happy, uh, contribution of open source. Thank you. So today I want to talk about what money can buy, what money can't buy, and how we should think about the role of money in open source. It's something that people talk about underfunded projects in open source. But the studies, let's try to get out of the apple. We are probably a lot of money to spend, maybe through grants or donations. How do you spend all that money? I think it's a important question to ask, because if we can't answer this question, why bother talking about money in open source at all? Why bother asking for donations or contracts or sponsorships? And that's what I want to talk about today. How should we think about the role of money in an open source system? So let me just show you how to potentially share with the open source. On the one hand, you hear people talking about underfunded projects, and on the other hand, you hear people saying, money runs everything and mission pays everything else. Both of these things have some truth to them. That's probably because there are different incentives that drive open source contributions. So when they answer the question of how do you spend money on the source, we have to start by asking, why do people contribute to the source in the first place? Turns out, people contribute to the source for a lot of reasons. Let me go through a couple of examples of what I see. The first is why you solve a problem. This is a truly trendy motivation, and it's especially relevant in the early stages of an open source project. So your first contribution, or when you first open source a project, these things often happen because someone wants to solve their own problem. Um, for casual contributions, this is by far the most common reason. And these one-time contributions make up nearly half of all contributors to top projects on GitHub. Second is reputation issues. So if that first time contributors just turn back, they might find that reputation becomes a good reason for taking around. Whether they like it or not, it will first become a public opinion source. And some people find that contributing to the source helps improve their higher ability or their power. Third one is community. For regular and longer-term contributors, another reason why they stick around is because they feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Sometimes trying to work in the source project feels like finding your community. And finally, you can tell people to contribute once, twice, or for many years, just because they think it's fun. Open source is a welcome distraction from where they're familiar life. And these are some of those common reasons I've seen why people contribute to the source. But another thing to consider is that these incentives change over time. And so we can actually let with this. Um, if you think about the process of going from using the project for the first time to making your first contribution to contributing regularly when you're in the senior project, it seems obvious that your everything that you might change over time. So while someone might contribute for the first time, uh, because they want to solve their own problem, maybe the community is not yet enough to figure out. And if you remember the time I talked before, I learned that uh, there's a famous program from that kind of about uh, teaching the language and teaching the community. It's kind of made up to 200 kids, so I'm going to go there. But that's technically the devil I'm talking about here. I'm talking about language and community. Thank you for, for being my devil. Um, anyway, so this is that. It's such an interesting for a container because reputational benefit happens all the time. So another reason that it's official to be known as a project maintainer early on, but at some point, even if you step down, we're probably still be known for having maintained that project. So you'll need another reason to stick around. The other thing is important. If you want to spend money smartly in the first, you need to start by meeting people where you're at. If you think where you're at, the boss is fine. And a lot of these things are actually working pretty well. And that's a really good thing. So for example, a first-time contributor doesn't really need a financial incentive to make a contribution. They might need help figuring out how to make a contribution, but that's different for a specific given motivation, a more about reducing friction. And so instead of replacing people's motivations, you should think about using money to help people do what they already feel motivated to do. So talk about that person wants to make a first-time contribution, they may be intimidated and they don't know how. So you can use money to host a workshop that make that experience more lovely. So, um, that's why I would say what the first project was based on money spent. Then I would say distributed incentives a little bit better, how should that project think about spending money? So we go through uh, different stages of the first project, and I talk about the role that money can play throughout. So first we have creating the project, then we have finding users, and then it's about training those users, taking contributors, and finally the longer-term maintenance aspect of the project. So first we get to create a project, right? Um, which we're thinking of the project to start off. And for creation in the beginning, um, but creation obviously happens throughout the life of a project, so there's major new features and improvements. So you can use ideas and the company trades of innovation, so if money is all an interesting problem, the difference is it can take a lot of time to implement all of them. While this work can be done without any funding at all, some of us want to spend days of time on a project that is probably the solution more likely to happen. So this is how funding helps people create, um, comes from the original story of the shift, which is the shift offer. Paul Ramsey, who's the chair of the shift, um, noted that while the district first predicted for free, there was actually another interesting person who got government funding that led to the first fruits. This is an example of the role that funding can play, because Paul noted that most people don't know this is actually story. So I think that was a spot on which I'm going to lose, um, the biggest software Kickstarter campaign today. Um, this spot was around for a while, but they recently wanted to make major updates and improvements, so the crowdfunding is just over a million dollars for that purpose. So now we need a project to find people to use it. At this stage, people are likely to be motivated by a sense of community, so they can use money to empower other people to spread the word. So it's not just community events, like email, travel, travel, swag, all that stuff will help expose more people to the project. And since a lot of new contributors start out as users, expanding the total number of users also helps to expand the potential group of contributors. Three examples are these Charles Coins for a project called Dware. The users motivated people who contributed to the project by conference, and it turned out to be pretty good advertising. To help fund the coins creation, Dware asked the public companies to sponsor them. So that users would stop bringing those users into uh, first time contributors. That's why most first time contributors already want to contribute for their own reasons. So this is more about paying for things that make it easier for them to do some. That's stuff like in person sprints, workshops, and interviews. This example was shown GoForCon earlier this year. So Jeff Rizal, who's on the Go team, claimed that they had a picture of workshops, and from there she learned um, the feedback about that, and they had a personal video. So much responded saying, yes, having never met any of these people before, they made the shooting feel significantly less scary. So, 